Hi, Anna here from Anna's Not Afraid. This channel is all about murder, crime, and mystery. Today, we're going to be talking about the disappearance and murder of Molly Bish. If by the end of this video you enjoyed, don't forget to give it a like, it really helps me out. Subscribe to this channel for more content like this and comment down below what you think about the disappearance and murder of Molly Bish. Molly Ann Bish, born on August 2nd, 1983 to parents John Senior and Maggie Bish. She was 16 years old and had two siblings, a brother named John Jr. and a sister named Heather. Her family had packed up their things from Detroit and moved to a town called Warren in Massachusetts. Her mother Maggie was an elementary school teacher and her father was a probation officer. Molly's personality was described as a being a bit silly, but she was also known to be very popular and outgoing. She loved to play softball, basketball, and soccer. She had recently began dating one of her classmates from school and they had gone to prom together. Molly was an honor student and she aspired to work with children. She had gotten a job as a lifeguard at the local swimming hall called Commons Pond in Warren. It was a man-made pond surrounded by woodlands. And before Molly had worked at the pool, her brother John Jr. had actually worked there for three years prior. The day of Molly's disappearance. It was a summer's day, June 27th in the year of 2000. Around 9 a.m., Molly and her mum, Maggie, began driving to Commons Pond in Warren. Molly had been upset that morning because Molly and her mum, Maggie, had found out one of Molly's soccer teammates had been seriously injured from being hit by a car during her bike to work earlier that morning. Molly had only been working for several days as a lifeguard at Commons Pond, so it was only her eighth day on the job and they had first day of summer swim lessons that morning. So she probably felt like she had to attend work despite being quite upset. At 9.50 a.m., Molly and her mum Maggie had made a stop to the local convenience store to buy some water bottles. And this had been filmed on surveillance via the cameras from the store. After this pit stop, they made their way to the police station to obtain the two-way radio walkie-talkies because there are no phones or communications available at Commons Pond due to the location of the area. This radio would be the only way for lifeguards to contact anyone outside of Commons Pond. Arriving at the pond around 10 a.m., Maggie dropped off Molly. Unknown to both of them at the time, this would unfortunately be the last time they would say goodbye to each other. Minutes after dropping her off, the other swimming lesson students would arrive. One of the parents that arrived first at the pond that day had noticed that Molly was not at her station. Her water bottle, sandals, beach chair, towel, whistle, police radio, and an open first aid kit were left there unattended. The parent thought that because she was young, she might have walked off to hang out with her friends. So one of the mothers had assumed the position of the lifeguard for the swimming lessons. And after that, she would inform Molly's boss of her disappearance. At 11.44 a.m. that morning, Molly's boss communicated via the two-way radio walkie-talkie to the police and reported Molly was missing. During that time, the Warren Police Department did not take the missing report seriously and assumed she had skipped work to hang out with her friends. When one o'clock in the afternoon had come around and Molly had not returned to her station, the police contacted Molly's parents about her missing from work. Maggie had told the police that she did drop her daughter off at the pond that morning. The search. An extensive search was immediately launched. It became the largest and most expensive search for a missing person ever undertaken in Massachusetts. After being notified of Molly's disappearance from the Warren Police Department, Maggie had phoned her daughter Heather, Molly's sister, to tell her about Molly. Heather had reportedly agreed that the situation was odd, so they decided to meet at the local police station. Upon arriving at the police station, they were reassured that there was nothing concerning about Molly's disappearance. According to authorities, they presumed the likelihood that Molly was just upset about her friend from soccer being injured and had wanted to blow off some steam. Obviously, Maggie and Heather were concerned and went to start looking for Molly. They set out to the hospital of Molly's soccer teammate to check if Molly was there visiting. Molly had not visited her friend that day. Heather went to visit Molly's boyfriend at his house. However, he had not seen her, nor was he too concerned about her sudden disappearance. Even though her boyfriend wasn't overly worried, Molly's boyfriend and sister Heather departed to the pond to meet with Maggie. 
They discussed how strange it was that Molly had left her shoes behind if she was going to wander off on her own. Maggie was arguing with the police telling them that her daughter would never have left her station as Molly had expressed worry to Maggie that morning about the kids starting their swimming lessons. After further conversations with the family, the police officers started to think they might be onto something and called the state police to assist with the investigation because the local police did not have much experience with missing persons cases. When the state police began investigating, they considered the possibility of Molly drowning in the pond. Molly's family disagreed with this because she was a strong swimmer and a lifeguard. The possibility of Molly drowning had upset John Jr. and he ran into the water, frantically trying to search for his sister, but was pulled back by authorities. Eventually, a dive team and boats had been brought in to search Commons Pond, but after many hours of looking, they had not found anything. All search of the area was called off until the next morning. Around 6 a.m. on the 28th of June, law enforcement had deployed all units which included a helicopter equipped with infrared imaging. The townspeople had communed to initiate their own search groups and the local businesses posted missing persons flyers on the store windows to assist with the search for Molly. Police started to look around a path that led from the sandy beach at Commons Pond to a cemetery nearby, thinking if there was a possibility of abduction, they could have left the area via the path and not be noticed by people. Looking at the evidence of Molly's opened first aid kit, the investigators were speculating the potential of someone faking an injury to lure Molly to abduct her. This was when Maggie realized something. The day before Molly's disappearance, June 26, 2000, Maggie described seeing a suspicious man, approximately 50 years old, salt and pepper hair with dark eyes and a mustache that had been smoking a cigarette, watching Molly with a glare. He was with a white car parked in the lot of the beach where Molly's lifeguard station was located. Even though Maggie thought he seemed suspicious at the time, she gave no further thought of the observation until Molly had disappeared. Maggie saw no sign of the strange man with the moustache the day of Molly's disappearance or his white sedan. There was, however, another witness whom reported that he saw a man matching the description of the strange moustache man in the pond's parking lot just moments before Molly had arrived that morning. They worked with an artist to create a composite sketch of the moustache man. John Jr. did not recognize him as a regular visitor of Commons Pond. After learning of the suspicious moustache man, the police had set up a roadblock and advised people of the town about the white sedan. Another local worker also described that he saw a similar looking parked car at the cemetery that connected to the pond by a pathway a few days prior. Many thousands of tips from all across the United States called in about the moustache man. However, they weren't helpful to the search. District Attorney John Conti and his team ordered for a search of all white vehicles from that area and 125 results came back. But with the lack of additional information about the type of vehicle, it did not assist in creating any new leads in the case. Later, the police would return to Commons Pond, but the scene was contaminated by first responders with too many footprints, fingerprints, and lots of cigarettes. It unfortunately meant they could not obtain any concrete evidence. With no evidence to further the investigation, they started compiling theories about Molly's disappearance that day. Theory one, she left voluntarily. There had been reported sightings of her around the country. However, her family objected to this theory as they believed that Molly wouldn't leave without telling them first. Theory number two, she knew her attacker. Her boss and her boyfriend were both considered persons of interest in the beginning of the case. Her boss had an alibi and her boyfriend, although uncooperative, he did pass a polygraph test. Police started to look into new leads by searching the area's registered sex offenders list. They attempted to check for legitimate alibis, but this was difficult due to many of them not being gamefully employed. Many were called in to participate in polygraph tests and there were some who showed signs of deception. The detectives had scoured through the past cases of Molly's dad, John Sr., because he worked as a probation officer, they considered that there might be a potential connection. However, most of those people that they investigated had only said kind things about John Sr. Almost three years after Molly's disappearance, the investigation reignited when, in May of 2003, there were two unrelated tips that came in identifying Molly had been sighted in Miami, Florida. Police had been preparing to go to Florida to follow up on the tip but on May 16th, they received another tip from a retired police officer 
whom thought there may be a connection to the 1993 abduction of a young girl called Holly Perenin. So how does Holly have anything to do with Molly's disappearance? Back in 1993, Holly and her brother were in Sturbridge, Massachusetts, visiting their grandmother. Holly and her brother went to see a neighbor's puppies and only her brother returned to their grandparents' home. The only trace of Holly was a shoe that they found on the side of a road. 10 weeks after vanishing, Holly's remains were discovered in the nearby woods. A letter from Molly was sent to the Puranen family during Holly's investigation. In Molly's letter, she wrote, I am very sorry. I wish I could make it up to you. Holly is a very pretty girl. She's almost as tall as me. I wish I knew Holly. I hope they found her. At this time, Holly and Molly were both aged 10 years old. So are there any connections between the two of them? Holly and Molly both had similar names. They both lived in Massachusetts within close proximity to each other. They're both blonde haired and blue eyed young girls who disappeared in Massachusetts. The discovery. In late fall of 2002, a local hunter named Ricky Baudrio had been at Whiskey Hill in Palmer and reportedly seen a blue bathing suit in the woods, but he didn't think anything of it at the time. In May of 2003, the hunter had mentioned this discovery to Tim McGugan, who was a local ex-cop looking into the disappearance of another young girl in the area. Tim was the one who contacted the authorities about this new information. Two weeks later, it was announced by authorities that a weather-beaten piece of blue bathing suit similar to the one Molly Bish was wearing on the day she disappeared, had been found on a wooded hillside. Tim McGuigan found the bathing suit, led there by hunter Ricky Baudrio. The hillside where this blue bathing suit was seen ended up being located five miles or eight kilometers from her family home. The bathing suit was sent off to be examined for forensic evidence and another search for Molly had begun. Six days after the bathing suit was sent off for examination, DNA testing results came back confirming it belonged to Molly Bish. On June 9th in 2003, after an extensive search of the surrounds, including over 500 areas near the location of the piece of blue bathing suit, the largest search of its kind in Massachusetts history, there was a bone discovered by police. The bone seemingly belonged to someone aged 14 to 20 years old. More searching would reveal a total of 26 bones and DNA evidence concluded it was Molly's remains. The finding of her remains unfortunately has not helped investigators find her killer. Molly Bish's murder is still unsolved at the time of this video and only 26 out of 206 bones were discovered. After finding Molly, the police believed their suspect to be a white male between the ages of 18 and 50 who was known to the area through either fishing or hunting. He most likely had a history of violence against women. There were quite a few suspects associated with the murder of Molly Bish. In 2005, a Connecticut resident was charged with attempted kidnapping in Connecticut and he was briefly under investigation with the case, but there's no other information about this suspect. In 2009, a new suspect was investigated, Rodney Stanger, a Florida resident convicted of murdering his girlfriend had lived in Southbridge, Massachusetts, which is a few miles from the town of Warren. He lived there for more than 20 years. Stanger moved to Florida only a year after Molly's murder. Following the murder of a Crystal Morrison, Stanger's girlfriend of 20 years, Morrison's sister alerted the Massachusetts authorities. Stanger was known to have access to a white car similar to the one seen the day before Bish's disappearance. He was also known to fish in Commons Pond and hunt in the woods where Molly's body was found. In addition, Stanger closely matched the description provided by Maggie Bish of the man seen in the white sedan the day before Molly's disappearance. Stanger had not been charged in her case. In 2009, when Stanger was investigated for the Bish murder, police also questioned him in the connection with the 1993 murder of Holly Perenin. In 2012, forensic evidence led authorities to name David Polio, He died in 2003, but they thought he might be a person of interest in the Piranin case. In November 2009, Gerald Battistoni, aka Confidential Informant 62 for the Eastern Hampton County Narcotic Task Force, was named as a suspect in Bish's death by private detective Dan Malley of Massachusetts. Battistoni served time in prison for repeatedly sexually assaulting a teenage girl in the 1990s. He attempted suicide in prison after newspaper articles identified him as a potential suspect in Bish's case and Perenin's death. 
but a stony who had a criminal record dating back to 1980 had been in the area where Bish's body was found and resembles a composite sketch of the man Maggie saw in the parking lot the day before Bish disappeared. Gerald Battistoni died at Lemuel Chatuk Hospital in Jamaica Plain in November 2014. There have been no arrests in the case as of June 2021, but Worcester County District Attorney Joseph Early announced a new person of interest on the 3rd of June 2021, a registered sex offender who died in 2016, Francis P. Sumner Sr., a man who has more than 20 pages of criminal record. He's being considered in the case. Sumner was found dead inside his Spencer home on the 4th of May 2016. Joseph Early did not say how Sumner was connected to the case, but the investigators recently received new information that has led to investigate him. Between then and now, Molly's case has been profiled on shows such as Disappeared, America's Most Wanted, Unsolved Mysteries, and 48 Hours. At the time of Molly's abduction, Amber Alerts was still three years away from being rolled out across the country. Police didn't think much of her disappearance in the early hours of Molly's disappearance, so they didn't close off the area surrounding her unattended belongings, and that would have contributed to contamination of the area. The woodland where Molly's remains were found have since been cleared and excavated into a motorsport park. Tim McGuigan legally fought to get a $100,000 reward for helping to locate Molly's remains, but lost a lawsuit against the district attorney's office to pay the reward as her killer has not been apprehended. John Sr. and Maggie Bish have founded the Molly Bish Foundation in 2004, aimed to raise awareness about child safety and abductions. The foundation has helped to have fingerprint and photo records of thousands of children. They helped pass a law that brought the Amber Alert system to Massachusetts. They have testified before the state legislature about laws involving sex offender registration and notification and redesigning state license plates to make them easier to see and to remember. In October of 2018, Molly's boyfriend at the time of her disappearance passed away in a car crash. John Jr., Molly's brother, has become an EMT in memory of his sister. Heather Bish, Molly's sister, through the Molly Bish Foundation, has been petitioning the legislature to change the law regarding how police may use DNA to identify suspects. As it stands now, police run a sample of DNA through a national database to find an exact match. If an exact match is found, it can be used to identify a suspect. Heather favors amending the laws to allow police to use partial matches or what are known as familial DNA matches when searching through a DNA database. Say, for example, that a DNA sample does not lead to an exact match in the database, but returns a hit on a DNA record that is pretty close. So close that it's likely a family member, a possible brother, cousin, or offspring. With that information, investigators could use the partial match to narrow their search. 14 states allow familial DNA searches. Massachusetts is not one of them. Anyone with information about the Molly Bish case should call the state police on 508 458-4537575. Thank you for watching. Like this video if you enjoyed. Comment below what theory or suspect you think could be involved in Molly Bish's murder. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys in the next crime video. Don't forget that if you want to request videos, you can leave them in the comments. Thanks guys. See you next time.